So now let's take a look at how we can apply these equations to a couple examples. And this first example is kind of simplified in that I'm not representing the, the resistance of the lines. It just makes it a lot easier if I just have the reactive portions of the line values. And so here's a generalized sort of a three-phase circuit. Um, I've got a, a source. I'm not modeling any mutual impedance in the source in this case. But I do have like a three-phase line segment. I've got a two-phase line segment. I've got a one-phase line segment. And so you can see for the three-phase segment that I've got self-impedances and mutual impedances to model. Um, as far as the, the values, I'm just going to go ahead and assume everything's transposed because, again, I'm trying to cut down on the number of parameters, but, but later on you'll see an example where we're using more of the actual numbers. And initially, I'm going to go ahead and work this in per unit. Uh, it just makes it a little bit cleaner as, as, as far as putting all the values together for the, the first example. So again, all these self-impedance terms are all the same. All the mutual impedance terms are going to just be all the same, just as if things were transposed. So what we're going to start off by doing is we're going to start off by uh, just kind of forming the different sub-matrices for, for Z-Bus. And so for this first source segment, I'm not modeling any mutual coupling. I'm using kind of a simplified model in this case. Um, basically, we just have terms on the diagonal. And so you could think about this as being the model of the substation. And then I've got the first feeder, which is three by three. I've got the second feeder, which is two by two. And I got the, the last feeder, the single phase feeder, which is just simply a one by one. But anyway, these are, these would be the kind of like the sub matrices that would be used to um, give us all the different impedances that we're going to need for this problem. And if you wanted to build this into a Z-Bus, if you wanted to draw this out, you certainly could draw this out. But you usually don't need to do this for a lot of practical problems. But again, if I do a trace from the bus all the way to the source, you can see again that these diagonal terms just simply have the summation of the impedances. And then what we have in the off diagonal are basically the common impedances between two different buses. And we also have to differentiate the, the, between buses and nodes because not every bus is going to have three phases. And so at bus number three, I just have phases A and B. And at bus number four, I just would have phase B. So now we'll take a look at a single line of ground fault. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and place this fault here on bus three, phase B. And so when I close the switch, I'm going to have a fault current. I'm just going to assume that the fault resistance in this case would just be equal to zero. And so what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a fault basically where the current's going to flow through here to that, to that ground point, to that earth connected point. And to do this, and what I would use, I would use seven equivalent circuit values as seen from, from bus number three. So in this case, if I'm talking about my Thevenin equivalent circuit, okay, what the Thevenin equivalent is going to be in this case is going to be the trace of all the impedances going to my source, which is going to be ZBB1 plus ZBB2 plus ZBB3. Okay, which is the same as ZS1 plus ZS2 plus ZS3. And this is going to total up to be J.15. Um, the Thevenin equivalent voltage is whatever voltage I have at bus 3 phase B. If I have a power flow program, I can get this from the power flow program. If I don't have the power flow program, I just would assume like a nominal voltage. So if I'm working per unit, this is maybe one. Now, here's one thing you have to watch out for when you're doing this type of analysis. So this is phase B now, right? So let's suppose phase A is our reference. The phase A source would be at zero degrees. If, if I have um, 
the conventional ABC phase shifts, we usually assume that phase B lags phase A by 120 degrees. Uh, phase C is gonna lead phase A by 120 degrees. And so when I put in this value for phase B, I need to make sure I put in minus 120 degrees. And this is very, very important because when I'm then calculating the change in voltage on phases A and B, I've got to have that phase shift modeled in there. Otherwise, I'm going to get the incorrect values. So then I, I take my Thevenin and voltage, um, divide by the Thevenin equivalent impedance, which is basically the sum of all the impedances going up toward the source. And I'm going to get 6.67 per unit amps, where I have a phase angle here at minus 210 degrees. And you can see in this case that this is lagging my voltage by nine degrees, because all I have is I have a reactance in the circuit. In general, what you're gonna see is you are gonna, you're probably gonna see something between, a, I don't know, 60 to 80 degree phase shift if I had resistances in the circuit. So we're gonna get a lot of lag in the current behind the voltage because that path is primarily gonna be reactive in nature. The other thing we're typically gonna see, if you look at the current levels, you know, if I, if I set my per unit system up correctly, um, I should be getting about one per unit current under normal load conditions. And you can see, you can see this current level here is you know, at least six times higher than what I would have under steady state conditions. So I would kind of expect to see pretty large values of, of fault current in, in the per unit system. So what is gonna be the impact of this fault on other voltages in the circuit? Uh, let's suppose what I'm doing in this case is I'm looking at what's gonna happen at bus three on phase A. Okay, this is gonna unfold at phase, right? So what I need to do is I need to calculate the change in the voltage at, at bus three phase A. In order to do this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this impedance term, uh, Z3A3B, this is a, a kind of an off diagonal term in the Z bus, and I'm gonna multiply this by I3B where that's the injected current at bus three phase B. Injected is gonna be minus IF. Okay, so what's gonna be Z3A3B? Well, that's basically the common impedances um, between those two um, points. And those common impedances are basically gonna be ZM2 plus ZM3, these mutual coupling types of terms. And so if I trace back up to the source, what's in common between 3A and 3B is ZM2 plus ZM3. So, when you multiply this out, then what we're gonna get is we're gonna get the change in the voltage at, at bus three. And what I do is to get the final value, I take the pre-fault value, which I'll just assume be one per unit. And this is actually at angle zero degrees because it's phase A. I add this change and what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get a new value with a magnitude of 1.073. Now this is sort of interesting because I said before, that we normally would get a voltage sag. And normally where we see the voltage sag is on buses or uh, bus phase combinations where the phase is the same as the faulted phase. However, if it's on an unfaulted phase, a lot of times we see a voltage rise. And the reason being is because of the way the, the phase shifts work, okay? So we have that B phase fault because of the phase shift relationships, it actually is gonna cause a voltage rise across some of the unfolded phases. Where this is kind of actually significant real life is if you have a fault and the fault creates an over voltage, if that over voltage is too high, you might actually cause some problems on your circuit like burning out surge arrestor devices. And so this is something we kind of pay attention to is how much over voltage we're gonna have on the unfolded phases. Um, now, if we're looking at bus number four and we're looking at phase B, okay, this is uh, this, the same phase we had the fault on. So now we're looking at, we're taking the Z, 4B, 3B term. This looks at the change in voltage at 4B with respect to current injection at 3B. 
we multiply this by the injected current, so it's minus IF. Um, the impedance that's in common between buses four and three is going to be ZS1 plus ZS2. That's that's same as this impedance term. And when I multiply this out, this gives me 0.7326 at angle 60 degrees. Again, if I add this to the prefault voltage on phase B, it's one at minus 120 degrees. So we're kind of looking at a, an unloaded system in this case. I add the change in voltage. Notice now that the voltage drops quite a bit. And so where this would be concerned to us is if we had certain equipment at that bus that was sensitive to under voltage, then likely that voltage would trip offline due to the fault. And so this is what we sometimes refer to as a voltage sag. And we'll be concerned about this in the future when we talk about uh, voltage power quality. We could also do a line to line fault. And this is gonna be set up a little bit differently where I've got a 12 kV circuit. So we can do this in terms of ohms and volts and amps. And in this case, what I'm giving you is I'm giving you the results of a power flow. So this is actually the scenario where you have the power flow to start from rather than just assuming all the voltages are nominal. And we'll do something kind of similar as far as calculating the fault current and what the changes in voltages are going to be at two different buses in the circuit. So in any way, in this particular scenario, here's our circuit. We won't assume a fault resistance. We'll just assume that um, when the fault happens at bus three phases A and B's have the same uh, voltage in this case. And these are the values that we're going to assume here for the impedances. And so these are all in ohms. And again, I'm not modeling the resistances, just make this a lot less complicated for this scenario. Um, something else I'm also doing in this scenario is I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that, that I have balanced conditions such that all the mutual terms on this three phase element are all going to be the same and all the self impedance terms are the same as well, just to keep things uh, simpler. So now when I have the fault, basically what I do is I, I create a loop in this case. This impedance in my Thevenin model is going to be the summation of all the impedances going back to the source. This is actually the summation of all the mutual impedances. This is the summation of all the impedances. And so I can build this seven equivalent model from bus number three based on just simply inspecting this particular circuit. And now when I calculate the fault current, it's just the difference in the two phase currents divided by two times the um, self impedance minus two times the mutual impedance. And so if I take this difference in voltages, being careful to put the right phase shift in there, then I get this current magnitude 3,261 amps at an angle of minus 60 degrees. So again, we don't necessarily need to build Z bus up in this case. I mean, basically by inspection, you can just do a circuit trace and you could, I'm sorry about that. Um, basically what you could do from the circuit trace is you could uh, figure out what values you need just by doing the circuit trace. Um, so again, for buses, three phases A and B, you know, in common between the two buses would be these two mutual impedances and also um, what you'd see for the um, self impedance value would be the ZS1 plus ZS2 plus ZS3. Um, so anyway, now that you've got this in um, fault current, then what you can do is again, you could use superposition to calculate what the new voltage is gonna be at the other buses. And so if we're gonna look at um, bus four phase B, then to get the post fault value, we take the pre fault value. And now this is a little bit more complex because I've got a fault current associated with phases A and B in this case. Um, and so what you would need to do is you would need to apply the appropriate um, mutual values in this case, the, the, the um, off diagonal terms for the impedances. 
And what you're gonna end up with this case is you're gonna end up with a voltage drop at bus number four. Uh, similarly, if you're gonna calculate the voltage at bus number three at phase A, uh, again, what we have to have is we have to have these um, off diagonal Z bus terms. And then basically, um, well, actually this term right here is actually a, on the diagonal um, because they're on the same phase. But, but anyway, what you would you do in this case is you can also calculate what this updated voltage would be at bus number three. Okay, so these are, um, I think, kind of straightforward if you just kind of spend some time taking a look at this right here. So here's a line to line and ground example, and I'm not going to spend much time on this because it, it involves a lot of manipulation. Um, basically, if you fault these buses together and you have an impedance with respect to ground, so giving you a ground path, and you're going to have to go through a lot of work in order to figure out all the various currents. Um, this would be the seven and equivalent circuit in this case. And really what's different in this case is you have this additional ground path. These are the equivalent values for the seven and voltage in the circuit that we get from the power flow. And then as far as the impedances that we're going to need, this is the self impedance and this is the mutual impedance. And then the net fault current that's flowing through this resistance RF is just simply the sum of IFA and IFB. So anyway, you'll write an equation for phase A, you'll write an equation for phase B. You've got an equation that relates these two voltages to this current IF, and you know that IFA plus IFB is equal to IF. And this gets you into four equations and four unknowns, which you then kind of have to manipulate in order to get all the variables. And you could kind of go through this on your own. Uh, I'm not going to give you a homework on this because this is just kind of a pain to, to come up with. Uh, similarly, if you want to go through and you can up, you can calculate all the changes in voltages and stuff like that using the same techniques we talked about earlier. Now, this is a three phase to, to ground type of case. And in this case, I don't have a fall resistance in this circuit. And so if we do this at bus number two, because that's we, we want to do this at a three phase bus, then basically what we can do is we can get the seven equivalent circuit from this. We're basically from bus number two, the self impedance is going to be ZS1 plus ZS2. And then we're just simply going to have this mutual impedance ZM2, which is soon to be the same between all the phases. Um, but what's a little bit different in this case is because we have an unbalanced power flow that these internal voltages are not all the same, all right? So maybe the impedances kind of look like a balanced circuit, but these from the power flow, these voltages are not the same. This is what we would actually get if we had a situation where we had like unbalanced loads to start with. And so, Given that we have these different Thevenin and voltages and this, this current going through this connection to earth is going to be the sum of the three currents. What we would do is we would write three equations in three unknowns. Um, there's a terminal condition where these terminal voltages are all equal to zero. Some of the three currents are going to be equal to IF in this case. And what you would do to solve this is you would Put this into a matrix format and you have to solve something of the form of ax equal to b so the way you would do this is to get x this would be a inverse times b so doing matlab for this would be probably the most convenient way to do this and what's kind of interesting about this is that because of the fact that we these internal voltages were not the same we don't exactly get balanced fault currents like you expect to see if you're doing symmetrical components. But this net fault current is actually pretty small, you know, pretty close to zero. Um, and so this is kind of what you would see in practice is you would see a lot of phase current, but, but not so much ground current in this case. 
and then if you want to calculate what are changes in voltages at other buses, say you're calculating the change in voltage at bus 1A, um, this is going to be the, the appropriate impedance term times the, the fault current. And we could actually go through then and figure out, well, what impact is this going to have a change in terms of changes at other buses? And it's going to be pretty major because these three phase faults generate a lot of current. And so, yeah, you're going to get voltage depressions all over the place for a three phase fault. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this example. You'll, you'll have a homework problem, which is kind of similar to this. But this is kind of shows you more of the setup for what you would start with if you're analyzing the circuit. And so what we're seeing in this case is we have a transmission source. In this case, the transmission source is 115 kV. And this transmission source could have some impedance associated with it. And then we have a substation transformer. In this case, this is a delta Y ground, very, very common uh, for a substation transformer. So we're stepping this down to 12.47 kV. We're not worried about the line regulation in this case. Uh, we'll just neglect that. And so I've got a three phase section, I've got a two phase section, a single phase section, where this shows my overhead construction. And so in this, Two phase, the positions would be A and C if this is going to be um, one phase, it, it doesn't really matter as much. Usually it's going to be one conductor is going to be over the neutral generally. Uh, and so anyway, you got the all this information available to you. Uh, where what you have is you've got information about the source and you got information about the transformer in this case. Uh, we've got information about the overhead feeders that we're assuming phases are four aught and ground wire is going to be at, um, at one aught. And then we have all this distance information that you're going to use for this. And so this is kind of combining everything we've used so far. To, together in order to solve this. Um, I'm not giving you in this particular case, I'm not, it looks like I'm not giving you a transmission system impedance. And so we're just kind of modeling the impedance of the transformer. But generally, that transformer is probably going to be maybe 70 or 80% of the net impedance anyway. So that doesn't get us too far off. So when you're working through here, then what I want you to do, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be coming up with the model parameters and then you're going to be calculating the values for a three phase fault, a line and line fault, and a single line of ground fault. And I'm not going to go through all these calculations, but basically what I'm kind of giving you is a little simple MATLAB script you can use for calculating uh, the different impedances, you know, for the three by three, the two by two, and the one by one. And note in this case that these diagonal terms now are not the same. So this is more real life than that simple example I started with. Um, but anyway, here's some MATLAB code for calculating um, these impedance values. And then kind of go through and show you, you know, what would all be the various impedances and things you would need to, to, to work with for doing all these different calculations. Um, but anyway, you'll go through this uh, in, the, in the homework where I'll have an example where I'll give you a couple of fault types and you'll do similar calculations. But what I wanted to really spend a little bit of time on before finishing this up is this, this windmill example, because windmill also does short circuit analysis. And there's actually a couple different techniques for, for windmill actually to do the short circuit analysis. So, so basically you're building this model up in windmill. Uh, you have a model right here for the 115 kV source. Basically, I'm plugging the line to line value here. Uh, note what I'm doing in this case is I'm using a base of 7200 volts line to ground because it's a 12.5 kV circuit. Um, I'm not associating any impedance with this, so I don't have any 115 kV values loaded in actually. Uh, for the transformer, this is delta Y ground. 
I'm going ahead and putting in the transformation ratio in here. And then what I'm doing for the transformer, instead of using the transformer model that has the core loss in it, I'm just modeling this with the ZSM value. And so I'm just entering this 1.5 plus J8 directly in terms of percent per unit, all right, which you can actually do. And so I'm just entering these values directly in. And then I'm building the line model, say four ought for the phase, one ought for the, the neutral, putting in all the spacing information in here. And know what this is gonna do is if I have single phase, it's gonna put the phase conductor in the middle. If I have two phases, it's gonna put the two phase conductors on the outside. And then when I run the analysis through, then what I'm going to see when I do the um, fault calculations, when I do the conventional short circuit analysis, what the program does is for each um, location in the circuit, what it does is just simply goes to all the different possible buses in the circuit and puts a fault there. And so if I'm talking about like putting a fault the end of feeder one versus feeder two versus feeder three, what it does is it, it goes through and calculates like phase of ground current, phase to phase current. Uh, it, it's going to calculate, you know, what the three phase current's going to be for all these possible different scenarios. And so this is, this is one type of analysis that you're going to see is basically you're going to see for all the different fault types on the circuit, for all the different combinations, and it usually assumes a, like a fault resistance that gets applied for minimum fault current. You just kind of see kind of a brute force. This is, this is what all the different possible fault currents are. This on the bottom, you don't need to worry about for now. Um, this is more for looking at the breakers and what they're doing is they're looking at what's called asymmetrical amps. Uh, when you have a fault, you actually get an offset, uh, DC offset in the current. And what they're actually doing is they're adding in that DC offset to figure out what the maximum instantaneous current would be. But that's not something we cover in this class. That's more something we talk about like in the transits class, like 587. But there's another type of analysis that's called fault flow. And you'll notice that when you run the regular fault current analysis, it doesn't tell you what the change in bus voltages is. It just tells you what all the currents are. But let's suppose you want to figure out what the changes in voltages are for a given fault location. You have to run a different type of a fault analysis called a fault flow. And what you would do in this case is you need to give it a location, you need to give it a type, and you need to give it a phase combination. And what it does is for that fault location, it's going to give you kind of the results like a power flow, where it gives you the current for that fault flowing in all the different elements and the voltages that you expect to see. And so in this case, we're, we're following phases A and C together. Fault B is, phase B is not faulted. So when you look at these results, what, what you're going to see in this particular case is you're going to see um, pretty high current values, say like on phases A and C, you're going to see kind of a dip in the voltages associated with the fault of phases A and C. But then you look at the unfault of phase, phase B, and it's still about 7.2 kV. It doesn't really get impacted that much in this particular scenario. But anyway, it's giving you the the different currents going through all these different elements is giving all the phase angles and things like that. So if you wanted to compare your analysis by hand with the windmill, what you need to do is you need to run the fault flow because this will actually give you all the magnitudes and angles in the voltages, um, which you could actually get when you work this stuff through by hand. Um, just to kind of wrap things up here, um, this, these notes at the end kind of talks about how you can actually generalize this if you're going to write an algorithm up. And 
the way this would actually go if you were going to try to write a computer for a computer program for all this is you would work up something kind of similar to a power flow. Um, basically, what you would do is you would start by running the power flow first, and that would give you all your initial bus voltages and line flows. And then what you would do for your faulted bus is you would get the three by three Thevenin equivalent for that faulted bus. And then you would calculate for all the different fault combinations or for the, um, the one in question, let's say for the fault flow, you would calculate say for line to line um, fault, what would be the, the current you would expect to see, right? And then what you can do is once you have the fault current at a given fault bus, and what you do is you superimpose those fault currents on top of the, the line pre-fault current. So assuming those line pre-fault currents are gonna hold, you can basically add the fault currents to that, get an updated post-fault line current, you sweep up toward the source, and then what you can do is you can start from the source, go back down toward the loads, and actually update all the different voltages. So in a way, you're kind of running like a power flow type of algorithm, and that's how a fault flow algorithm would actually work. And so actually, this kind of talks about how the sweep technique kind of matches up to, to what you just did. So there's some material in Kirsting's book on this. Um, Kirsting does this in terms of Y bus approach, which is correct, but it's not really what you could use for working this stuff through by hand. What Kirsting's showing you is he's showing you how you would set up a computer program. And so if you're gonna use a computer program, what he's talking about would kind of make sense. Um, Tom Short's book, this has a lot of pretty good information about fault characteristics. It does have some stuff in there on fault calculations, but he uses symmetrical components. And so it's, it's kind of limited to the situations you can use symmetrical components. And if you want some good background on what are causes of faults, there's actually another book that's available as an ebook, book by Richard Brown, Electric uh, Power Distribution Reliability, which we're kind of referenced to when we get to the reliability material. So, so anyway, um, it's a lot of stuff we talked about here for the fault analysis. You know, this isn't a class on protection. But since we're talking about different analysis techniques based on modeling, then I still wanted to kind of go through and kind of show you where these values would come from. Probably more realistically, you'd use a computer program to calculate all these values. But again, you want to know where these values are coming from. So this isn't something in real life you're likely to do that much by hand. Um, but this should give you the background to kind of understand how these computer programs would actually do these calculations. Okay, thanks.